and say go. How's it going, guys? I'm Cody. And this is Eli, and you are watching slash listening to the Commander Cafe. Welcome to 2018. 2017 was a great year for Commander, and here's hoping 2018 will be just as good. And also a great year for the channel. The amount of growth we've seen in the last month and a half we've had since we started this channel has been amazing, and I can't wait to see what awaits the channel in 2018. You guys, you're awesome. Yeah, uh, so far we're already over 50 subscribers, and we're going to start trying to figure out if we can do a giveaway at 100 subscribers, so... Uh, Go ahead and subscribe so you can be a part of that. Um, we should say that at the time of the recording of this video, I don't think all of the cards in Rival of Ixalan has been spoiled yet. But in order to get the video out in a timely manner, we have had to record a bit early, but most, if not all, the rares and mythics have been spoiled. Which, all the cards we tend to care about most in Commander are, so I think we'll be okay. But if there's a card you think is going to be great for Commander and we didn't talk about it, that's probably why. So leave a comment and we'll discuss it down in the comments later. Anyways, so the set reviews tend to be a little bit longer, so let's jump right in. So our first legendary is Zedapa Primal Dawn, which is 6 colorless and 2 white for a legendary creature dinosaur. Uh, it's uh, flying, double strike, vigilance, trample, and indestructible, and it's a 4-8. Yeah, so this is the first in the di Elder Dinosaur Cycles. Um, I can see him being a Voltron commander, but outside of that, I'm not sure how much play you'll really see. The 8 mana is a bit tough. Um, the double strike, the nice thing about it, so the good things about it being a Voltron is it has flying, so it has evasion, and the double strike will put its damage at 8. Um, and when you're looking at Voltron commanders, 7 or 11 are the, are the numbers you want to hit, so the fact that it comes in over 7... It'll only take three hits to kill them with commander damage is good. Um, I could see people building around them, but... That's kind of uh, probably included in the 99. Yeah. Uh, next up we have Nezahal, Primal Tide. Five colorless and two blue. For a legendary creature elder dinosaur, he can't be countered. He gives you no maximum hand size. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, you draw a card and discard three cards to exile him and return him to the battlefield tapped under his owner's control at the beginning of the next end step in a 7-7. Seven, seven. So this one's... It's probably the one I'm most excited for. Um, I don't, again, don't think it'll be a great commander. Um, I don't think any of these dinosaurs in this cycle will be great commanders on their own. Um, but as a late-game bomb, I think no maximum hand size is great. Getting to draw cards on the creature itself is great, and you're going to be doing that a lot. It's... It's a lot like Rhystic Study in that aspect. And the fact that you can disco discard those cards to protect himself is pretty good. Mm -hmm. After that, we have Tezimok, Primal Death, 4 colorless and 2 black for a legendary creature elder dinosaur, Death Touch. Uh, you can pay 1 black to reveal him from your hand and put a prey counter on target creature. Activate only during your turn. When he enters the battlefield, destroy each creature your opponent controls with a prey counter on it. And he's a 6-6. Six, six. So definitely not made to be a commander, um, because he cares about being in your hand. Um, but overall, a pretty strong ability. Yeah, you can basically, for if you build it up for a couple of turns, wipe mm -hmm. them out. Yeah. You can get, as long as you have like one extra mana... Actually, um, you can even do it multiple times per, ter per turn. So... Yeah. Like, you can just drop six mana, hit six things, and then next turn, cast them and kill a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Next is the Mono Red, um, which I think is probably the one most potential to be a commander. But even then, I still think um, it will be better in 99. But he's Atali, Primal Storm, four colorless, two red, for legendary creature, Elder Dinosaur, 6-6. Six, six. Whenever it enter attacks, exile the top card of each player's library, then you may cast any number of non-land cards exiled this way without paying your mana cost. So we're cheating mana cost. Um, it helps. It does reveal your deck as well, so you're getting four things for free. Mm -hmm. um, so Gyra, um, that plays with big things, wants to cheat mana cost, is going to be great with this. Um, cheating mana cost is always just good. You even get to play some of your opponent's stuff, which mm -hmm. is... Oh, it's just fun to do. And then finally is green for Gatala, Primal Hunger. 
He is 10 colorless mana and 2 green. Uh, he was the game day promo. Uh, he's a legendary creature, Elder Dinosaur, and he cost X less to cast, where X is the total power of creatures you control, and he's a trample with 12-12. I could also see this one being a commander on its own, um, because mono green can ramp out and get the bigger creatures, and a lot of times drop this for just 2 green, and 12 with trample is, is pretty intimidating, so... Could even see elves spamming out just enough elves that you have yep. twelve or ten out, and suddenly tap two of those elves and give you a giant dinosaur. Yeah, I think the green it's going to be good in a lot of green decks. Next up is the multicolor commanders that I think would be more fun as commanders. I think they have more potential overall, and I think they'll see more play than the elder dinosaurs will. So first up is Azor, the Lawbringer. Two colorless, two white, and two blue for a legendary creature, Sphinx. He is a 6-6 with flying, and when he enters the battlefield, each opponent can't cast instants or sorcery spells during that player's next turn. When Azor attacks, you may pay X, white, and two blue, and if you do, you gain X life and draw X cards. So decks that flicker, which Blue White likes to do a lot, like Drago is going to love him, even if he's not a commander himself. But even as the commander, um, you're in the colors to flicker him, take a lot of advantage of his ability. Um, very strong lockdown commander. Um, I like him a lot. Yeah. Do you note that he locks down their instants and sorceries during their turn, however, only during their individual turns, so you can get around it by casting your spells on other turns yep. if this gets used against you. Yep. In the life gain and draw cards, I think, will be relevant just because he does have that flying ability, so he does have evasion that way. Mm -hmm. Next up comes the vampire commander, El... Alinda? El Alinda, the yeah. Dusk Rose. Two colorless, a white, and a black for a legendary creature, Vampire Knight, with lifelink. Whenever another creature dies, put a 1-1 counter on her, and when she dies, create X-1-1 white vampire creature tokens with lifelink, where X is her power. And she is a 1-1 to start. So, Egger, you're going you're going to love this. Um, she fits right into Egger. Everything about her synergizes well with that deck. Get, cares about counters, um, makes tokens when she dies. Um, yeah, it's going to be a great include in that deck. As far as the commander... I'm not sure. I, I think Edgar would be the better way to go. Gives you access to red and synergizes better, but still a very good card for that deck. Next up, we have the Merfolk Edition. Kumena, Tyrant of Orkaza. For one colorless, a green, and a blue, you get a legendary creature, Merfolk Shaman, which is a 2-4 and allows you to tap another untapped Merfolk you control, and it can't be blocked this turn. You can tap three untapped merfolks you control to draw a card, or tap five untapped merfolks you control, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each merfolk you control. So, merfolk tribal commander, I'm not sure how I feel. Like, he'll be fun. I see a lot of people building around just for the fun factor of the merfolks. Um, tapping three to draw a card is a bit much when we blue already has creatures that, like a zombie or... Um, What's the one that taps to draw three cards? The the new wizard, right? It's or not new, but yeah, um, Arcanus. Yeah. So he taps to draw three on his own. You don't have to draw tap three to draw one card, um, which they may go in this deck because they are in blue. So a bit underwhelming, but good new include for a Merfolk commander type. Deck. And then the big one, Big Zakama, Primal Calamity he is. Six and Naya, that's red, green, and white for a legendary creature, Elder Dinosaur. He's a 9-9 nine -nine with Vigilant Reach Trample. And when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, untap all lands you control. Then he has two and a red, deals three damage to target creature. Two and a green, destroy target artifact or enchantment. Two and a white, gain three life. So I think that this is the one people are most excited for. Um, it's It's... I've never been a fan of Naya, but I could see myself building a deck around this because I love having options. So, you have to keep in mind, you're casting him for 9. If you have 9 lands to do that, which 
if you're playing this deck, you're probably ramping into the lands, not so much mana rocks or mana dorks. So you'll have the nine lands. They all come untapped. You can do any of his abilities three times that turn. Um, so any legendary that comes in and can take care of a threat, um, multiple threats, even if, if it's artifacts or enchantments or smaller creatures, is going to be good. He has also the nice thing of it's when he enters the battlefield, so you can flicker him. And just... um, it is on cast, though. So it's a it's a weird. Oh, this right. is the if other weird part. It. Yeah, it's a ETB effect, but only if you cast it. So it's not on cast, which is sim- what we see a lot, or ETB. It's kind of a both, both of them. So you can't flicker it to get it, but if you cast it and it gets countered, you still don't get the untap. So it's yeah. very strange in that way. I don't know if there's a card that is worded that way outside of him, um, but it's a very interesting type of ability going on there. I'm curious to see if we'll see this coming up in the future. Yeah, I, I, I think the dinosaur deck, I don't know if this is... The interesting thing is he doesn't necessarily have to be a dino tribal deck. I would probably not build him dino tribal, but he can go into the other dino tribal deck that's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it'll be interesting. We can see him in a couple of places. Um, I think he'll be fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him. So next up we have the Planeswalkers of the set. Uh, these are the two that will be included in the actual set itself, not in the Planeswalker decks. Yep. So first we have Huatli, Radiant Champion, that two good colorless, pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> green and white. For uh, She comes in with three loyalty counters. Her plus one lets you put a loyalty counter on, on her for each creature you control. Minus one, target creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. And minus eight, you get an emblem with where whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. Yeah, I see this scene play in a lot of token strategies, which it's in the right colors for. Anything that wants to spam out a bunch of qu- creatures quickly, because that first ability, the plus one, just protects her. It, mm-hmm. Like... It's just huge protection. If you have 10 creatures out, she has 13 loyalty. You have to get that down or she can ultimate in, in a token deck or a deck that's just spamming out creatures. That last that emblem's going to end the game. That gives green right uh, tokens all the draw it needs, which is something that normally it struggles a little yeah. bit with. Next up we have Angrath, the Flame Chained. Um, three and black red for Legendary Planeswalker. Comes in with four loyalty. Each opponent discards a card and loses two life. It is his plus one. Minus three. Gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap it. It gains haste until end of turn. Sack it at the beginning of the next end step. If it has converted mana, it costs three or less. And each opponent loses life equal to the number of cards in his or her graveyard. For minus eight. For minus eight, yes. Um, I'm going to probably be trying to get a hold of this for the Marquesa of the Black Rose deck. Um, mm-hmm. Just for that second ability, gaining control, um, and sack it if it's small enough. Otherwise, that deck has enough sack outlets that it can, but... Um, it's just an overall nice effect for Radkus. Yep. So, and the discard a card, the fact that each opponent makes it tons better than targeted. Um, I don't yeah. care about the losing two life, but... I feel like they've been doing that a lot lately, is changing it to each opponent, yeah. which is very nice for the commander community. And it's part of what makes um, Nicol Bolas Godfaro so good, is his plus one ability. Each opponent exiles two cards from their hand. Mm-hmm. So it, this does a similar thing of protecting itself by, if they have nothing in their hand to answer it, then they're probably not going to the next round of the table either, because you're making them discard a card. Mm-hmm. Next up, we're going into white. Which is, and we'll start off with Slaughter the, St- the Strong, which is one and two white. Each player chooses any number of creature he or she controls with total power four or less, then sacks all other creatures he or she controls. So a really nice board wipe for the set. Uh, kind of, I see it as kind of pairing off with Bone Two's Last Reckoning as a three mana board mm-hmm. wipe that they've released for standard right now. Yeah, the the fact that it's three mana board wipe is strong, and the also the ability to kind of build your deck around it, knowing that it's in there. Mm-hmm. So, um, great in token decks or decks like um, Alicia that smiles at death that want has a bunch of small creatures, so this isn't going to hit you. 
and the fact that it gets around indestructible creatures by making them sack it. Yeah. Um, makes this a really good board wipe. Very effective. Uh, next up we have Bishop of Binding. Three colorless and a white for a vampire cleric. 1-1. One, one. When the, he enters the battlefield, exile target creature and opponent controls until he leaves the battlefield. Whenever he attacks, target vampire gets plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the power of the exiled card. Yeah, this one... Again, a lot of good vampires in this set for um, Edgar or any vampire tribal strategy. Um, this one, it's a it, nice boost in addition to a yeah. exile effect. Yeah, that's the nice thing is most of these ones that come in when they come in, exile something, put something underneath it. They're I'm not super big on them, but the fact that this also pumps itself or mm-hmm. pumps another vampire. Um, it's good. I like it. Yeah. Cool. Next up is one that's going to be interesting to see him play. It's Sphinx's Decree. It's one in a white. Sorcery. Each opponent can't cast instants or sorcery spells during that player's next turn. So very much like Azor, like we talked about. Um, and like you said, it's very much... Like, it, you, they can still cast instants during each other's turns, but during theirs, it's locked down. So if, you have, if you're playing against um, Chu Yun... This is going to shut him down hard. Mm-hmm. Any Voltron type strategy like that that's using instants to pump him up. Um, even Infect. Infect uses a lot of um, combat tricks. This will shut them down as well. It's a lot of spell slinger decks that will revolve around certain sorceries as well. Mm-hmm. A lot of board wipes because their sorcery speed, unless they have ways to flash them out or um, play them at instant speed, is going to get shut down for that rotation too. So, mm-hmm. Very good to have. Next up, we have Paladin of Atonement. One colorless and a white for another vampire knight. At the beginning of each upkeep, if you lost life last turn, put a 1-1 counter on Paladin of Atonement. When he dies, you gain life equal to its toughness. So another good one for Edgar, especially for Edgar, because he it cares about the 1-1 counters that Edgar can put on. So the bigger he gets, the more life you're going to gain when he finally does die. Um, so... Your opponents are going to have to answer it quickly, especially if you have Edgar out and you can put 1-1 counters on there pretty efficiently. Um, yeah, Mardu decks that care about the counters is going to be good in there too. So he'll fit into a few few decks, not just the Vampire Tribals, I, I think. I see this going in Anafenza for me. Yep. So yeah. definitely a nice little bonus card to have. And it's cheap too, and it's going to grow. So very Yeah, value. for two mana, um, it's going to get... You're going to get a lot of value out of that card, I think. Next up, we have Trapjaw Tyrant. It's 3 and 2 white for a creature dinosaur. 5-5 five, five, um, with Enrage. And when it's dealt damage, exile target creature and opponent controls until Tyrant leaves the battlefield. So this is going to make it very hard for your opponents to attack into you if you have him out as a blocker. Mm-hmm. Um, so any Pillow Fort type deck, I could see this fitting into um, my Marquesa, Queen Marquesa deck. I could see this going in. Um, just as a kind of a protection. If you have, if you do have a dinosaur deck, because of all the enrage effects, I could easily see mm-hmm. things, cards like Ryle, even mm-hmm. just being good cards to have with things like this out. Or a pinger deck, if you if your deck has a bunch of pings, like tap to deal one damage to target creature. Mm-hmm. Um, you can just exile everybody it, because those decks tend to have ways to untap them. So you can just ping, ping, ping four damage to them each turn. And just exile a ton of stuff. Yeah. And the final white, we have Temple Altasaur. Four colorless and a white for a dinosaur. If a source would deal damage to another dinosaur you control, prevent all but one of that damage. Very defensive dinosaur. Um, I think is almost an auto clue in those dinosaur decks. Mm-hmm. Um, very helpful. Allows you to attack in without fear with the other dinosaurs, um, which a lot of them have trample. Um, so you want to be attacking, or if you do have to pit, put shields up, um, you're going to be able to keep your dinosaurs out there quite a bit. And also because the dinosaurs, a lot of them have enraged, that if they take that one damage, it still triggers that enraged trigger if they if that matters for them. So I think it would be a good include for that dinosaur deck. But mm-hmm. Moving on, we have the blue cards, starting with Crafty Cat Purse. Cut Three, purse. Cut purse. Not cat purse. Cat purse. <laughs> <laughs> Three colorless and a blue for a human pirate. You can flash him out. 
and when he enters the battlefield, each token that would be created under an opponent's control this turn is created under your control instead, and he is a 2-2. So this will shut down a lot of those infinite token decks, even if they stop it. Um, so if you cast it at the beginning and they stop, then you've stopped their infinite combo at least for that turn, um, which is going to be huge. If it's an infinite combo that ha everything has to stack up first before the tokens come in, then you can wait until they decide to stop their thing and say, I have a, I'm have going to make a hundred tokens, now the stack is going to resolve, flash it in, you just got a hundred tokens. Um, but even, I think most of the time it's going to just stop those tokens from coming in. You'll get like one squirrel or one, um, what, the, any kiki jiki combo, you'll get one of those, and then but you'll stop it, and that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're making the human, uh, or the Grixis pirate deck, mm -hmm. uh, this is an easy card to include, and it still s helps shut down other yeah. particular decks that might be in your meta. And it's also human, which is a another relative creature type for tribal synergies if you're looking at that. Mm -hmm. So next up we have Andu Induced Amnesia for two and a blue. You get an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, target player exiles all cards from his or her hand face down then draws that many cards. When it is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, return the exile card to the owner's hand. So I, this is a fun build around I think. Um... Especially if you have like telepathy or sin triplets, so you know their hand, and you're and you're afraid of something, you don't want them to have that. You can swap that out. Mm -hmm. um, the other way I could see this doing is if you have a way to exile enchantments, because this is um, they get those cards back when it's put into the graveyard from the battlefield, um, and so if you can exile this, those cards won't come back. Uh, but, it's extra helpful for. If you have any players in your group that like to draw the majority of their deck, mm -hmm. then just put this out, and suddenly they're them. down to yeah, nearly nothing left, and all of their answers get shut down with this card. And I think the other thing that's interesting to note on this um, is that the fact that it's target player, so you can target yourself if you don't like your hand and you want a fresh hand, and then later on, if you have removal for enchantments, you can remove this and get all those cards back later on so using on yourself is definitely a viable option is probably what i would actually probably use the most unless i had ways to know what their hand was mm -hmm. next up we have kumena's awakening two colorless and two blue for an enchantment with ascend and at e at the beginning of your upkeep each player draws a card if you have the city's blessing instead only you draw a card so um, we should mention, I think this is the first one we've had that had Ascend. Mm -hmm. It is, if you control 10 more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. Which, if you're... It'll be interesting to see how much it's worth putting those cards in. I could see... I don't know if you could build a deck around that mechanic, but um, the payoff is usually enough that... In Commander, it's easy enough to get those 10 permanents because it does count lands. A lot of these um, cards that I've been seeing with Ascend, I would be perfectly fine with just including, yeah. even without focusing, because I know you're probably game gonna I have 10 lands yeah. alone. Absolutely. So, Nekuzar is going to want this. Mm -hmm. Begin of your upkeep, each player draws a card. If you have the Sage Blessing, only you. Sometimes you're not even going to want that Ascend if you're in Nekuzar, um, especially. But, constant card draw, much better, I think, than like one-time use spells of card draw. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you get to continuously get this is going to be good. Next up, we have Release to the Wind. Two colorless and a blue for an instant that exiles target non-land permanent, and for as long as that card remains exiled, its owner may cast it without paying its mana cost. So this one's interesting. Um, I was trying to find good ways to... I would want to play this. I think the big thing, you're going to want to use it on your stuff to protect it from a board wipe or... Um, target removal, you can do this, put it into X out, it's going to be safe there, and then later on when you want it, in step before your turn, cast it as pseudo haste, um, big combo pieces, anything like that, big creatures, big bombs that you want to keep protected. I Definitely so. good for if you want to protect or if you want to abuse some casting mechanics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any on cast or ETB effects is going to make use of this. Um, and it sometimes you can just use it to save yourself from an attack coming in. Mm -hmm. Attacks are going to kill you. You're going to exile. They'll cast it 
on their next main phase, but that does save you a turn. Yeah. Following that, we have Seafloor Oracle. Two colorless and two blue for a merfolk wizard. And whenever a merfolk you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card, and it's a 2-3. So I love these kind of abilities. I love Biden of um, Thalia, that whenever a creature deals combat damage, you draw a card. Um, it encourages you to attack, which is... It prevents the game state from just kind of everyone sitting back. Um, great for merfolk tribal. Merfolk has a lot of unblockable cards, so this would be good for them. Um, so I could see this thing playing those Merfolk tribal decks as, mm -hmm. as part of their card, card draw. And next up, we have one that everyone's talking about as being combo pieces. There's lots of ways to make this infinite. Um, is Time Stream Navigator. It's one in a blue, really cheap, for a creature human pirate wizard. It has a sin, so if you control 10 or more permanents, you get the city's blessing. Um, then you can pay 2 and blue blue tap it and put um, it on the bottom of its owner's library and then you take an extra turn after this one activate this ability only if you have the city's blessing so Analia, you can get a second copy of this if you have the mana to activate it that turn as well um, which being a two drop I think is what really helps that so you mm -hmm. get that extra turn and then the next turn you can activate this one um, but there's a lot of combos where if you can copy this make a token of it you can just go infinite with turns if you can consistently do that. Yeah. Following that, we have the black. black. So, starting off with Champion of Dusk. Three colorless and two black for a vampire knight. When it enters a battlefield, you draw X cards and lose X life, where X is the number of vampires you control. I can see this being very good in um, vampire tribal, especially ones that have life gain, so you don't worry about losing the life. Um... But it's going to be great card draw. Edgar will probably won it because you're making the vampire token, so this will get you a lot. Um, and you can actually stack those. You should, yeah, yeah. If it's working the way I think it is, don't quote me on this, but the ETB effect with Edgar, you should be able to create the token, yeah, stack it so that the token comes in, then it counts that when this one resolves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've had players do that yeah. with Edgar. So you, you can play with it that way. Um, I think it's a good card draw in black, so it'll be good. Next up, we have an extra fun one for those who mm -hmm. like to cast other people's cards. Dead Man's Chest. One colorless and a black for an enchantment. Aura. Uh, enchanted, enchant creature and opponent controls. When the enchanted creature dies, exile cards equal to its power from the top of its owner's library. You may cast non-land cards from among them for as long as they remain exiled. And you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast those spells. So I think this is going in your sin triplets. It really pretty is. Pretty easily. Um, <laughs> uh, Gonti is going to want it as well. Um, Villainous wealth decks. Mm. Anything Sultai that's running that as one of the main things. Yeah. Yeah, this is... It's a fun card. I, I'm going to... It'd be interesting to see the politics of the table once you get this out. Because it's like, if it's a big threat... Do people want to pl uh, get rid of it to protect themselves, but knowing that you're going to get those cards... Um, Usually the creature you choose to enchant is going to be from the deck that has the toughest creatures, so mm -hmm. getting rid of that creature, you're going to get a bunch of tough creatures. Yeah. I'd use it on dragons. Yep, and you're in black, so you have lots of creature removal, so a lot of times you'll be able to play this and remove it at the same time, or you might even make a deal with the player you did it with to kind of be like threatened to eliminate their creature because you haven't sent him to mm -hmm. and then be like hey I won't kill that unless you if you attack this person over here so I think I can see a lot of fun coming from this card following that we have Twilight Prophet two colorless and two black for a vampire cleric with flying he has ascend and at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have the city's blessing, reveal the top card of your library and put it in your hand. Each opponent loses X life and you gain X life, or X is that card's converted mana cost. This is probably one of my favorites from this this set. Um, my Ailey deck's going to want it. Queen Marquesa's going to want it. This is one I'm excited to get my hands on because it's card draw. And the fact, in black, most of your card draw hurts you. Um, the fact that... Like, each opponent is losing that life instead of you, and you're actually gaining that life. 
I would be perfectly happy with a card that didn't even take the opponent's life away. Mm hmm. So this yeah. is just even better. Yeah, if it just did. I would be happy with it if it just revealed the top card and you put it in your hand. That's extra card draw at the beginning mm-hmm. of your turn. The fact that you gain life and it's hurting everyone else at the table is going to be great. And it has flying, so it's a little more uh, mm-hmm. untouchable Yep. in some ways. Yeah, if you need to block a dragon or other flyer, it can serve duty that way. But I'm excited for this one. This is one of my favorite cards, I think, from this set. Next up, we have Vona's Hunger. Two and a black for an instant with a send. Each opponent sacks a creature. If you have the city's blessing, instead each opponent sacks half the creatures he or she controls rounded up. So kind of a pseudo board wipe for three mana. At instant speed. Yeah, I think that's the thing that really sells this card to me is the fact that it's instant speed. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're probably going to have that city's blessing, so they're sacking half their cards or half their creatures. And it's each opponent. Um, The Voltron player is going to hate you because they're sacking their their big creature that is coming at you. Um, I'm excited for this card. Yeah. The fact that they choose makes it a little bit worse, but... Still, still, half the creatures rounded up, even three creatures, they only get to keep one. Yeah, yeah, you're going to hit quite a bit of of stuff with this one. And after that, we have Red, with (laughs) one of the most controversial cards, I'd say. Yeah, definitely the most talked about. If you go to the forums, this is the one you've seen. It is Blood Sun... Two and a red. Whenever Blood Sun enters the battlefield, draw a card. All lands lose all abilities except for mana abilities. So there's been a lot of talk and discussion about how this works. And we've actually found the official rulings from Wizards. And um, so we'll go through that real, real quick before we analyze the card and everything. So um, first up, a mana ability is an ability that produces mana, not an ability that costs mana. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, land cards not on the battlefield aren't affected. So lands in your hand still have their abilities. Uh, if a land has an ability that triggers when it enters the battlefield, it will lose that ability before it triggers. Yep, so things that will... Bounce lands or bounce scry lands, lands. Tap lands, anything like that. Um, th- so your tap lands aren't going to come in tapped. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. And then, if a land has an ability that causes it to enter the battlefield tap, like we just said, it will lose the ability before it applies. The same is also true of any abilities of a land that modify how it enters the battlefield. Um, or apply as it enters the battlefield, such as the first ability of an unclaimed territory. So, unclaimed territory, as it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. You won't get to choose that creature type, so you won't actually get its second ability. You'll only get to tap it for colorless mana. Um, you won't get the ability to add one mana of any color, but you can only spend it for the creatures of the chosen type. So it shuts that one down pretty hard, anything like that. If a land gains an ability after Blood Sun enters the battlefield, it keeps that ability. So all the enchant land style things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you enchant your land like um, uh, Overgrowth to make it, it taps and it adds two green to your mana, it still keeps those abilities. Um, I guess that's a big example, because that's still a mana ability. But there's, a, there's a few things that give them, like, draw abilities yeah. for paying life and stuff Ta- like or, that. Yeah, the Underworld Connections, tap it to draw a card, it would still have that ability. Um, which I think I thought was interesting. So. If a land has an ability that continuously changes the types of other lands, such as Urborg, Tomb of Yagmoth, that ability will apply before Blood Sun removes that land's abilities. If a land has the, an ability that grants abilities to other objects, Blood Sun will stop it from doing so. This is the one I think is the most confusing. Um, and I've, I see it having the most like rules questions about it. Um, I don't even really know what to make of it. It's, like, it's, it's just a weird ruling on it. I think the Wizards will have to come out and clarify this. But, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not um, entirely sure how Urborg will still have an effect. Yeah. Besides, I'm not sure if it... Like, it has that ability and it applies it so everything swamps but then blood soon removes it so it takes it away i the way they worded it is kind of weird i i think they will have to do a better job of Mm -hmm. rewording that so we know what they're talking about Uh, Um, overall this does fit into some more decks than just uh mono red than like blood moon yeah um it's going to it, it does actually benefit more lands than it hurts because of all the bounce lands and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, tap lands. Everything just comes in. They still provide all the mana. I could play if I had uh, 
just any of those bounce lands yeah, that can, tap for are two just mana suddenly land. two mana lands that come in untapped. Yeah, yeah, it makes them very powerful. Um, but then you can also use it offensively, so it shuts down... Um, there's a lot of cards in Commando that we see that shuts down. Willowquay Tower, you no longer have maximum hand size. Homeward Path gets shut down. High Market, Maze of Ith. Some of the flip lands um, that are new here get shut down by it. So it's interesting to see how you can use it and building your deck with knowing that you have this in there so you can play more bounce lands or tap lands than you normally would. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that you can eventually play this and make those better. And you can leave out stuff like Homeward Path and High Market, Maze of Ith that would do nothing once this is out there. Yeah. So I think it would be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing it um, and using it. So. Mm -hmm. Next up we have... In red, Brass's Bounty, six and a red for a sorcery. For each land you control, create a colorless treasure artifact token uh, with tap to sac uh, tap and sacrifice this artifact to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Yep. So I think this is going. It's great ramp in red. Um, Neheb the Eternal is going to love this a lot. Um, really, any anything with red is going to like it because it. It's very powerful ramp, and it's something that you normally see, like, we would see this kind of building from green, but the mm -hmm. fact that we're seeing it in red, I think, is very good. It's also a promo coming up here. Yeah. Not, I don't quite remember what for, but it's an upcoming promo we have. Maybe the pre-release, or... Yeah, pre-release, or something like that. So you'll Buy a box. be sure to get your hands on it somehow. Next up is another fun, fun card. I've always had a soft part... Soft spark... the Soft, soft spot. spot for these phoenixes. Uh, so we have Rekindling Phoenix. It is 2 and 2 red for a creature phoenix. 4-3 with flying. When it dies, create a 0-1 elemental creature token with, at the beginning of your upkeep, sack this creature and return target creature name Rekindling Phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste until end of turn. So, I just like this a lot. It's a free blocker... Um, because it's, good, it's just going to recur itself as long as your um, token doesn't die before and, your upkeep. And this doesn't get exiled. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's pretty hard to remove. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be a huge bomb. It's not going to be a huge threat. But the fact that it's recurrable, um, anything, if your deck cares about creatures entering the battlefield, so you'll get this trigger... You'll get the token trigger when this dies. You'll get this coming back in. You can really cycle those and take advantage of those quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's a fun card. I'm going to enjoy that one, too. Next up, we have Dire Fleet Daredevil. A con one colorless and a red. For a human pirate with first strike, uh, it's a 2-1. When it enters the battlefield, uh, exile instant or sorcery from an opponent's graveyard. You can cast that card, spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast that spell. And if that card would be put into the graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So we've seen this ability quite a bit. The fact that we're seeing it on a red 2-drop is interesting. Um, normally this kind of ability is restricted to blue. So the fact that we're going outside the color pie is kind of interesting. It's basically Snapcaster in red for your opponent's cards. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever wanted to... If you have a way to flash this out, if you have a Dalkin Orbery or something like that to do that... You could have counter spells in mono red, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Um, Path to Exile. There's a lot of good stuff in Commander that um, you would want to hit with this. Following that, we have Form of the Dinosaur. Four colorless and two red for an enchantment. When Form of the Dinosaur enters the battlefield, your life becomes 15. At the beginning of your upkeep, Form of the Dinosaur deals 15 damage to target creature and opponent controls, and that creature deals damage equal to its power to you. So this one's interesting. Um, I'm sure there's ways to break this that I don't know about. Um, but I think there's a few fringe decks that are going to want this. Mm -hmm. it'll, be, it'll be kind of fun to play if you're in a life gain deck, um, so you can recover from the 15 quickly. It'll be um, good in there. If you are get down to like 5, and you can actually boost your life total with this, um, if you're below 15, it's actually a positive for you. So It is a recurrable 15 damage to, every cre or to any creature you choose. Mm -hmm. um, however, just note that it will kill you if you don't have a way around it. Yeah, 
the the fact that it's six mana, you won't be playing it too early, so your life will probably be lower. So you'll probably be around fifteen twenty by the time you cast this anyway. So it shouldn't hurt you too bad. It's going to hit, remove pretty much everything, um, anything that isn't indestructible or mm -hmm. protection from red. It'll be good. Following that, we have Silverclad Ferocidons. Five colorless and two red for a dinosaur with enrage. Whenever it deals is dealt damage, each opponent sacrifices a permanent. It's an 8-5. So, pretty so, tough. So, yeah. Um, it's a big body, and it's an edict effect in red. Anytime you can force your opponents to sack creatures is good. Because it gets around indestructible, and just the same as the other dinosaur, if you have a ping deck, and that's the kind of deck I would put these in, is ways that I could make sure that they're getting damage dealt to them, um, and do a lot, so I can do like, in separately too. Um, so, deal one damage, deal one damage, deal one damage, so you get those triggers individually, mm -hmm. because it wouldn't stack if it's like, four at once. Yeah. It, it's You're still getting one trigger from that, but if you can do it one, one, one and make each opponent sack two, three, four creatures in the turn, it's going to be a lot of fun. Nice thing is, it does say each permanent, so it can even start taking things out once they're out of creatures. Yeah. So if you wipe out their board, if, if you get this out after the person before you d does a board wipe, and you can just start pinging it, you're getting rid of their lands. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it hits a lot of stuff. Next we have Tilana... Eyes Summoner, a colorless and a red for a human shaman with Ascend. Uh, when it attacks, you may pay X and a red. If you do, create X 1-1 one, one red elemental creature tokens that are tapped and attacking. At the beginning of the next end step, exile those tokens unless you have the city's blessing. Yeah, I'm excited for this, um, especially since it's a 2-drop, and it's just a giant mana sink. Mana sinks are good, especially in red. If you're a mono red, um... You're a little low on card draw, so a lot of times you'll just empty your hand and have no cards to actually use mana on. So the fact that this is just a giant mana, seek, mana sink is mm -hmm. pretty good. And if you have Ascend, you're just flooding the field with 1-1 one, one red elementals. So mm -hmm. always something that red wants is a lot of bodies that can do a lot of attacking. Yeah, this is going if you're in Perfos or have one of the enchantments that whenever a creature enters the battlefield deals damage to each opponent like that, you this can get out of hand really quick. Mm -hmm. And last we have green. Well, not last because we have some multicolors and flip stuff. But uh, Starting up in green, we have Deep Root Elite. One colorless and a green for a merfolk warrior. Whenever another merfolk enters the battlefield under your control, put a 1-1 one, one counter on target merfolk you control. Yeah, this says per pushing tribals a lot. And um, I think Merfolk, other than Pirates, is probably the weakest. We haven't seen too many Pirates in this set that care about Pirate Synergies, like we have the Merfolks or Dinosaurs. Um, but Merfolks is definitely the most tribal synergistic, I think. Mm -hmm. So, it'd be good. Getting 1-1 one, one counters is... And the, if, you compare, if you combine it with that enchantment, when you cast a Merfolk spell, you create a Merfolk token... Because that's an ETB, they're getting 1-1 one, one counter, so... Yeah, you can really definitely a lot of ways to break this. Yeah. Next, we have Path of Discovery. Three colorless and a green. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it explores. This one I can see being a b bit fringier. Um, explore isn't terribly exciting in Commander, but the fact that this can give it to each one... Um, so if you're a deck that cares about 1-1 one, one counters, like your Anafenza, something like that, mm -hmm. um, if nothing else, it's... It does help if you it's get a land, lands out, too. Yeah, it's card draw on land. Um, and you get to... or You put it back, or you get to put it in your graveyard. Mm -hmm. I think that ability is also underrated, so if it's something you don't need, you can toss it. Or if your deck cares about... If it's like a Marin deck that wants stuff in the grave, you can just pitch stuff that you want there. Um... I yeah. can see benefits. I don't see any making a huge impact, but still being played. It's one of those accruing value cards. Yep. Next, we have Polyraptor. This one is getting another, or quite a bit of conversation as well about it. Uh, it's six colorless and two green for a 5-5 five, five dinosaur. 
It has Enrage. Whenever it is dealt damage, create a token that's a copy, copy of Polyraptor. Yeah, and it's a 5-5. Five, five. It's The fact that it, it goes infinite in quite a few ways. Um, I've seen a lot of people talking infinite combos with this pretty easily. Um, and it's a 5-5. Five, five. Mm -hmm. So it would be good regardless. But Yeah, with anything that can deal damage to creatures entering the battlefield, you can... You'll start killing off some of the tokens, but it's growing at a fast enough rate that yeah, yeah. You'll you'll net advantage if you're dealing like creature comes in, deal one damage to a target creature, and you just keep pinging each one that comes in. You can um, make infinite polyraptors and yeah, just go to town. Just make sure it is a may ability that's dealing the damage, or you may not be able to stop and and then an infinite loop and draw the game out. Yeah. Yep. So don't do that, but make sure you can stop it. Um, next we have Tinder Shoot Dryad. Actually, no, because you can get around the infinite uh, loop by pinging damage to another creature. True. So you could stop it that way. Um, but anyway, next up we have Tinder Shoot Dryad. Um, four colorless and a green for a Dryad 2-2. Two -two. Has a send, and at the beginning of your each upkeep, um, create a 1-1 one -one sapling creature token. And saplings you control get plus 2, plus 2 as long as you have the city's blessing. So the fact that it's each upkeep and not your upkeep makes this miles better than if it was just your upkeep. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's like each rotation at the table, if you're playing a four-person game, you're getting four saplings, and if you have the city's blessing, then it's a 2-2. Two -two. Uh, or they're three threes. They get plus two, plus two. Um, Which, but if this is the only creature you've played and you've just used the five mana to get it, mm -hmm. by your next turn, or by the yeah, next yeah. person after you in the rotation, right? No. So you won't get yeah, it by your next turn. Yeah, your next uh, turn. You will have the sitting blessing, so that they will all get buffed. Yep. Yeah, because you'll have the five lands you use to cast this, and then you'll have this one and four others. So, yeah, by your next turn, you're going to have that city's blessing. This is going in my fungus deck immediately. Plus, I love the artwork. The artwork is pretty sweet on there. Mm -hmm. But kind of makes me think of Groot. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised it's a rare, actually. Uh, I guess because it's not going to see a ton of play in standard or anything. But for a commander, the that each upkeep. Anytime you see each upkeep on a card, it's probably one to give a good look at for a commander because it's probably pretty good. Next, we have Wayward Sword Tooth. Two colorless and a green for a dinosaur with a send. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. In addition, he can't attack or block unless you have the city's blessing, and he's a 5-5. Five five. That is... that is ridiculous. I don't even care about the city's blessing. I would pay three mana just to play an additional land on each of my turns. I don't even want to attack with it. <laughs> no, I'm fine without the city's blessing. I just want it to stay there. Um, yeah, I think any green deck, you put this in. Um, I can see this being a lot of money because those other cards that have this ability that you can play additional lands... Um, they get up there. Exploration, uh, what's the legendary creature? Is like a sixty dollar card. Yeah, that, that does one's this. Just... I think that one's too additional, but still, yeah. um, playing additional lands with card draw is broken. So this is easily being one of the handful of cards I snatch up specifically. Mm -hmm. Same. That is released. Yeah, it's going. I'll it include in all my green decks, especially Titania, um, mm -hmm. where I have forty five lands in there. So. I'm going to play additional lands. It's going to be fun. Next up, we have World Shaper. Um, it's three and a green. Creature Merfolk Shaman. Whenever World Shaper attacks, you may put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. And when it dies, put all land cards from your graveyard onto the battlefield tapped. And it is a 3-3. Three, three. So another include for, like, Getrog Titania decks that are tossing um, lands to the grave. Marin, I even want it because you're milling yourself putting those cards in the grave and getting benefit when it dies so mm -hmm. quick way to ramp if you're mm -hmm. low on mana for some finishing combo yep yeah because you'll probably hit at least one land when you mill those three cards so and decks that this goes in is probably going to have more than that so yeah um titanium especially i i know my titanium deck's going to want this just because it has so many cards in the grave if i can get those back it's going to be great Next up, we have the flip cards, which I've been looking forward to these. Yeah, I have to say I'm, I was a little more disappointed this rotation than I was last time. Um, 
I think I don't think these are quite as strong, and they're a little more specific. But there's a few decks that um, definitely gonna want them, and they will be good in. Mm -hmm. uh, this next one is great for Marin. Mm -hmm. uh, Journey to Eternity, a colorless black and green for a legendary enchantment aura. Enchant creature you control. When enchanted creature dies, return it to the battlefield under your control, and then return Journey to the Eternity to the battlefield transformed under your control. And it becomes Atzal, Cave of Eternity, Legendary Land. You can tap it for one mana of any color to your mana pool, or you can tap uh, the land plus three colorless, a black and a green, to return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Yeah, the fact that we generate your creature, like... That's pretty good. The fact that it'll turn into this land that allows you to get stuff back. Um, graveyard decks like Marin are going to definitely want this. And even decks that don't care that much about the graveyard. Recursion's always going to be good, so it'd be yeah, a good include. This is an absolutely amazing card. I'm. This is one, probably one of the ones I'm trying for the most to yeah. find once the set comes out. Next we have Profane Procession. One white or one colorless, one white, one black for a legendary enchantment. It has three white black exile target creature. Then, if there are three or more cards exiled with it, transform it. It transforms into Tomb of the Dusk Rose. You will tap it at one mana of any color to your mana pool, and then you can pay two, a white, and a black to tap it. Put a creature card exile with this permanent card onto the battlefield under your control. The mana cost is a bit expensive, but. Like, my Ailey deck, getting to exile those creatures, then later on getting to cast them. Because the cast, I think, is going it's going to be much cheaper mm -hmm. than what you're exiling with it. You're exiling stuff that has 6, 7, 8 mana is the things you really want to hit. So then you're casting them for 4. Yeah, uh, it's basically you're able to steal anything you want of your, preferably their bo your opponent's bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not even want to flip this until semi late in the game until yeah. you've picked out what your targets are actually going to be yeah instant speed exile is good even if it is five mana um black and white the problem is black and white has those abilities already for cheaper cost mm -hmm. um so you really do like the the second ability the flip side is what's going to make you either want this in your deck or not uh this one is amazing for Brea. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, this is going into Brea immediately as soon as I get it. All of the other kind of artifact decks are kind of probably going to be a little disappointed because a lot of them are more Esper than having Is It with the red. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of um, artifact with blue and red outside of Brea, but... Uh, but overall, this is still a great card. Storm the Vault. Two colorless, a blue and a red. Legendary Enchantment. When one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player, create a colorless treasure artifact token with sacrifice this artifact, add a mana to your, of any color to your mana pool, and at the beginning of your end step, if you control five or more artifacts, transform it. When it transforms, it becomes Vault of Cattle Clan, uh, a legendary land that can add one mana of any color to your mana pool, yeah, or we don't care about that. <laughs> it can tap to add a blue tier mana pool for each artifact you control. That so yeah, is... Brea, this is going to be amazing because a lot of times you're going to cast this. So if you cast the Brea, you have Brea and two Thopters. Cast this the next turn. Attack with one of those Thopters. It's flipping at the end of that turn. Mm -hmm. um, because that's your five artifacts. And it ramped you because it gave you the um, treasure token in addition to being able to tap for four, five with the treasure token. Yeah. No, four, I guess. Yeah, it's going to tap at least for four blue on your next turn. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it's... I, I wish that there were a few more artifact commander decks. However, in Brea alone, this is it's an a amazing house. card. Yeah. yeah, it is one of the cards you want to search for if you can. If you have Brea, you're getting this card. And yeah. I don't think it's going to be too expensive because I don't see it seeing a ton of play. Yeah, is it doesn't really normally have too many mm -hmm. artifacts out. So even in standard, like the pirate deck that would care about treasures is usually black blue. Yeah. So it doesn't include the red. So it's not usually Grixis. I don't see. Any <coughs> excuse me, being too expensive. So. 
Next up, we have another really fun one. I'm after this one. Uh, Azor's Gateway 2, uh, colorless. It's a legendary artifact, and you can pay one mana and tap it to draw a card, then exile a card from your hand. If cards with five or more different converted mana costs are exiled with Azor's Gateway, you gain five life, untap Azor's Gateway, and transform it. Then it becomes Sanctum of the Sun. Uh, and you can tap it to add X mana of any one color to your mana pool where X is your life total, which you just gained five more life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really easy in Commander to exile five different things of different mana costs. The main issue is just finding things you want to exile, or you're fine with exiling. But even then, your benefit at the end is going to be worth it. Yeah, the, the fact that it's colorless and goes in every deck is good. Um... The biggest issue I see is making sure it sticks around long enough to exile five different cards um, mm -hmm. with different mana costs and willing to give those up. Um, because, like, the front side, like, it, you have to flip it to make it worthwhile. And if you're in a life gain deck, you you can basically give yourself infinite mana with this card because you are you can tap it for, if you have 100 life, 100 mana, you're, you're casting everything you want. Mm -hmm. um, it is one, you tap it for X mana of any one color. Um, but even then, you don't usually care. And even if you're not life gain, like, it's still tapping for 20, say, by the time you get this yeah. huge ramp. Um, I would look for stuff like um, Stitcher, right? Uh, the the blue zombie wizard. Uh, Stitcher Giroff? Not Stitcher Giroff. Um, Gisa? No. Oh Fate Stitcher. There Fate we go. Stitcher. Yes. Um, Fate Stitcher, one of my favorite cards. I don't know why I forgot that, but you can untap this and do it again. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way to go is if you have ways to untap this um, Paradox Engine, you can just oh, cast legendary something. Oh, land. Non-land is Paradox Engine. No, but the um, artifact just to get the right. stuff exiled. You can t do this, unwinding play something, clock. unwinding clock, ways to do this so that by your next rotation you're flipping it. I think it's good. Even Brea, Brea can give you life for a lot of your stuff. So, mm -hmm. and it's a really one thing I really like about the card: two colorless to get it out. So, it's an easy get it out early in the game. You don't necessarily have to flip it too soon. It's yeah. just a little better to do so. Yep. Yeah. And also, one thing I just noticed reading it: like, I'm pretty sure. Don't quote me on this because I could be wrong, but I'm not seeing any reason you can't exile a land, and it's a zero mana cost. So it's yeah, converted mana cost is zero. So you can should be able to exile a land with this if you have enough lands in hand, and that's one of your cards. So next up, just plain artifacts, which are still pretty great. Uh, the Immortal Sun, uh, six colorless for a legendary artifact. Players can't activate Planeswalker ab loyalty abilities. That alone, I would be <laughs> probably fine with. But then, in addition, at the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card. Awesome. Already great. Next up, spells you cast cost one less to cast. Could it get any better? <laughs> it could. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Yeah, so this has everything I really want in a commander deck. The two things I really look for is card draw and ramp. And this does it both. In addition to that, it busts my creatures as an Anthem ability and stops players from activating Planeswalker's loyalties ability. So that Super Friends deck is just shut down now. Mm -hmm. Like, this A lot is... of the Super Friends decks even use the Planeswalker abilities to get rid of stuff, so mm -hmm. you just killed their removal. Yep. Yeah, it's a fun card. It's six mana, it's a bit pricey, but it gives you a ton of stuff. So I think it's well ca costed for what it is and what it does. Um... I would almost expect it to be more mana. Yeah. Yeah, it does a bunch of stuff. If your meta plays a lot of Planeswalkers, um, definitely put this in a lot of your decks. If Artifacts, you need more anthems yep. alone, this is a great anthem because it's all creatures you control, not just certain types. Yep. You don't have to pick a creature type. Yep, tokens is going to be great. Um, and reducing costs. This, this is an amazing card. Yeah. Um, Next up, we have Silent Gravestone. One colorless for an artifact. Cards in graveyards can't be the targets of spells or abilities. You can also tap four and uh, tap it and exile Silent Gravestone. 
and all cards from all graveyards, and then you get to draw a card. Yeah. This one, it shuts down so many um, decks in our format. There's so many decks that care about the graveyard, interact with the graveyard. Bajuka Bog is in every one of my black decks because it just exiles target players' mm -hmm. library. This is one mana, and they can't be the target of spells or abilities. Brea is an ability that targets the graveyard. That, sh that one mana, you shut down that whole deck until they deal with this. Marin entirely mm -hmm. done for. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what I said? Uh, you said it's Brea. Oh, Brea. Not Brea, Marin. I I'm stuck on Brea because I love her, and there's a <laughs> bunch of good artifacts in here for her, but... Uh, Marin is what I meant, yeah. It shuts down that entire deck, so... Plenty of the zombie decks, uh... Mm -hmm. You can shut down if someone's using the Scarab God. Mm-hmm. They can't target them. Um, Cassiger. Get a uh, Giraffe and guess a because you're casting them from that's not targeting can still do it, but you can exile their graveyard, mm -hmm. um, so you can shut them down pretty efficiently. Shuts down a lot of strategy in our format. Yeah, it's it's a very nice just staple to kind of run one mana mm -hmm. easy spot to fill. Fits in every deck. Um, so yeah, I see this going into a lot of decks depending on your meta. So, so anyway, I think that's it, guys. Um, I think it's a pretty good start to 2018. I think this set's going to be good for Commander. Um, I'm excited to see how things play out with it. They keep printing really cool abilities on this yeah. whole last set that's yeah. giving me really high hopes that Dominaria is just going to be... Don't even get me started on Dominaria. <laughs> I'm so stoked to go back to Dominaria. Um... The lore there, having to ferry Karn, Jiber, all coming back. Um, some of my favorite characters. I'm sure we'll see a Johnny again. Um, but I think this is going to be a good year. We have, we're seeing a bunch of good stuff that is going to do see a lot of play in Commander. Core um, sets. I'm fairly certain there's coming always back. Commander cards in there that yeah. I want. Yeah, we'll see a lot of good stuff this year. Um, and hopefully our channel is going to keep continuing to grow this year. We have a lot of um, big plans for this channel. I think this will be a good year for us. We'll get off our first full year of videos out. Um, so and we'll see how it goes. At as many milestones as possible, we're going to be giving stuff away. So go ahead and hit like, subscribe, share this to your friends, share it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, do whatever. Yep. But the um, more that the more people that subscribe, the sooner we can start. So the more you guys support us, the more we'll try and make. We, we try our best to make high-quality content from you, for you guys from the start. Um, I think the fact that we've seen so many subscribers in such short amount of time in the past month has shown that um, you guys appreciate the content that we're putting out, and we're going to keep continue to do our best with it. So thank you guys a lot. Don't forget to leave in the comments any deck tech ideas that you want to give out or anything that you just want to hear us uh, make an episode on. Just mm -hmm. leave us a note. We'll yep. bring tell it up us, in the show. Tell us what your guys' favorite card from this set is. Um, should be a fun set. I'm looking forward to the um, pre-release this weekend. Um, good luck to you guys out there entering in that. Um, hopefully, you get some good pulls. Um, be sure to send us a tweet on, or yeah, send us a tweet of your good pulls this weekend, and we'd love to see it, see them. Love communicating with you guys and having that out. And by the way, we'll leave a link to our Twitter in the bio so that you can. Send us a tweet with your cards. Yep. We will see you guys later. And thank you for watching Commander Cafe. Bye.